If the original marriage was typological for all marriages for all time, as Yeshua and Paul understood it, then polygamy obviously goes against God's intent for marriage. Well, I'm going to bring up the topic of polygamy, and this is a very difficult topic. Uh, it's no secret that many men in the Bible, uh, including men that are called righteous, like King David and Jacob, they engaged in this practice of polygamy. And the Torah even has regulations concerning polygamous marriages. So this has led some people to conclude that the Bible permits or even endorses this practice. And understandably, this is a very big problem with women because most women are not cool with sharing their husband with another lady, and that's understandable. So many feminist critics will point to the Bible's alleged endorsement of polygamy and say that this is proof that the Bible views women as property, the property of their husbands. So where do we begin in um, addressing this? Well, I have four points that I want to make here. And unfortunately, because of time, we won't really be able to get into everything and unpack it as much as I'd like. However, get my book when it comes out because I have an entire chapter that's devoted to this topic. So the four points that I want to make are number one, like homosexuality, polygamy is a clear deviation from God's original design from, for marriage as established in creation. Number two, the Torah does in fact prohibit the practice of polygamy. Number three, rather than being endorsed in the Bible, polygamy is consistently painted in a negative light. And number four, the passages used to say that polygamy is approved by God are misunderstood. So regarding the first point that like homosexuality, polygamy is a clear deviation from God's original design for marriage. It's pretty self-evident, right? We've all read Genesis 1 and 2. Monogamy is God's original design for marriage. Also, both Yeshua and Paul affirm monogamy by using the creation ideal as the basis for their other teachings on the topic of marriage. When they talk about what marriage is supposed to look like, they assume monogamy. And while my, monogamy may not have been the focus of their teachings, it is nevertheless the, the assumed model in every mention of marriage throughout the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 7.2 says, quote, Each man shall have his own wife, and each woman her own husband. In 1 Timothy 3, Paul said that elders and deacons within the church are to only have one wife, husbands of one wife which again reinforces monogamy for everyone since elders are to be examples of a righteous living to the rest of the church. A prohibition of polygamy can even be logically deduced from Yeshua's statement in Matthew 19 that a man who divorces his wife without warrant and marries another commits adultery. He says, if you divorce your wife and marry another, you commit adultery against your first wife. As the scholar Philip uh, Siegel explains, he says, Yeshua would not call a divorced man's remarriage adultery if he was permitted a second wife, which makes sense. Therefore, if the original marriage was typological for all marriages for all time, as Yeshua and Paul understood it, then polygamy obviously goes against God's intent for marriage. But what about the second point, that the Torah does prohibit polygamy? Because lots of people say, like, well, that sounds nice, David, but you can't say that polygamy is a sin or that it's wrong because there's no commandments against it. There's no commandment in the Torah that says that polygamy is a sin. That's a fair point, okay? But consider this commandment from Leviticus 18.18. 18. Leviticus 18.18 18 says, you shall not marry a woman in addition to her sister as a rival while she is alive to uncover her nakedness. You shall not marry a woman in addition to her sister as a rival while she is alive to uncover her nakedness. Now, this verse is traditionally understood as prohibiting only one type of polygamy. It's uh, traditionally commonly understood that this prohibits only a marriage to two sisters while both are alive. So only that kind of polygamy is prohibited, all right? However, scholars have pointed out several reasons to think 
that this verse does not necessarily refer to two blood-related sisters, but to two women in general. And if that is correct, we have a direct commandment forbidding polygamy in the Torah. By the way, we know that this interpretation was held by first century Jews. In uh, at least some sects of first century Jews, um, the Qumran community, for example, they have writings, commentaries, like the Temple Scroll, where they reference Leviticus 18.18 18 and use it to prohibit polygamy. So they reference Leviticus 18.18 18, and the way that they interpret that command is as a ban on polygamy generally. And I would argue that the apostles sh shared that same perspective. But why should we believe that Qumran is correct, that the Qumran community is correct? Why should we believe that Leviticus 18.18 18 prohibits all polygamy rather than simply prohibiting a marriage between a man and literal sisters? Well, first, in Hebrew, a woman in addition to her sister, which is the verse, do not marry a woman in addition to her sister, in Hebrew, that phrase is isha el achota, which literally means a woman to her sister. Scholars have pointed out that this is an idiomatic expression that is always used in the distributive sense of one in addition to another. This is going to get a little bit technical, but bear with me. Exodus 26 says, speaks of the coupling of curtains and clasps one to another. It talks about coupling curtains and clasps one to another, which is literally a woman to her sister, Isha el -Chota. Ezekiel 1 speaks of the wings of the cherubim touching one another, Isha el -Chota, a woman to her sister. In Hebrew, that's the exact same phrase that is used in Leviticus 18.18. 18. In fact, every single time the phrase Isha el Achota occurs in the Tanakh, in the Hebrew scriptures, it is used idiomatically. It is used in an idiomatic manner, meaning one to another. This is also the case with the masculine equivalent of the phrase, Ish el Achu, which literally is a man to his brother. Every single time this, the masculine equivalent of the phrase is used, it's used idiomatically. So therefore, when we interpret this phrase in light of its consistent usage, Leviticus 18.18 18 ought to there be, therefore be understood as saying, you shall not marry one woman in addition to another. If we interpret the phrase the way it appears everywhere else in the Hebrew Bible, we should, be under, we should understand Leviticus 18.18 18 to say, you shall not marry one woman in addition to another. There are, that's not the only reason, by the way. There are several other additional grammatical and exegetical evidences that substantiate this interpretation. And if you're interested, I have an article on my website uh, where I unpack this a little bit more. Uh, I also talk about it in my upcoming book. And I wish I could go through it all now, but we simply don't have time. So for now, let's move on to the third point, which is that polygamy is consistently painted in a negative light and therefore discouraged rather than encouraged. So, in addition to the moral and legal statements against polygamy, the biblical authors teach against polygamy through narrative clues. And uh, they do this by revealing the disastrous consequences of the practice. Basically, they're trying to discourage the practice by writing about it uh, and giving clues in the narratives themselves that, that would discourage it. Dr. Richard Davidson says, in the patriarchal period, there are several biblical examples of plural marriages. Although these biblical narratives provide no explicit verbal condemnation of this practice, the narrator presents each account in such a way as to underscore a theology of disapproval. The record of these polygamous relationships bristles with discord, rivalry, heartache, and even rebellion, revealing the motivations and or disastrous consequences that invariably accompanied such departures from God's Edenic ideal. We have Abraham and the disaster with Sarah and Hagar. We have Jacob, and of course, we have King Solomon, right? In 1 Kings 11, the biblical author is clear that Solomon's idolatry and eventual downfall were a direct result of his polygamy. 
the negative consequences of polygamy throughout Israel's history is perhaps a big reason the Jews all but abandoned the practice by the first century. Uh, David Instone Brewer writes that polygamy, quote, was not widespread and it was already declining in the first century. He goes on to say that, quote, there was already an established feeling that polygamy was inappropriate. And of course, we know that some Jewish sects outright uh, prohibited polygamy. And I would argue that the, the apostles were, uh, they shared that perspective. All right, so really quick, the fourth point is that the passages that allegedly approve of polygamy have been misunderstood. I won't get through all of these, but I will address a couple. What about Deuteronomy 21, 15 through 17, which details inheritance rights for a polygamous family? A lot of people will say like, well, the Torah literally regulates polygamy. It literally tells you what to do when a man has two wives, what you're supposed to do in that. And it gives regulations and laws concerning that situation. So how could God be against polygamy? Well, first, it's a mistake to assume that the existence of laws addressing negative situations proves that God approves of the situation. Think about it. There are all kinds of laws addressing negative situations. There are laws for restitution. When someone steals something, what are you to do when someone steals something? Well, there are laws for restitution in that situation, but those laws don't legitimize theft. Deuteronomy 23.18 forbids prostitute wages from being used as payment for vows, but the existence of that law doesn't legitimize prostitution. So in the same way, the existence of a law detailing the rights of, a first, of the firstborn in a less than ideal situation, that is a polygamous family, that doesn't legitimize polygamy. What about 2 Samuel 12? In 2 Samuel 12, God declares through Nathan that he gave Saul's wives to David. He even says, you know, I, if you needed more, I would have given you more. And he mentions a whole bunch of things of Saul's and mentions his wives along with it. So people will say, see, how can God be against polygamy if he gave David multiple wives himself? Well, first, why do we assume that God's giving David of Saul's wives entails that David married them? It's a complete baseless assumption. It's nowhere mentioned in the text. We just assume that. All the passage is saying is that Saul's entire estate has been transferred to David's care. Nothing in the text indicates that he married them at all. Second, David couldn't have married Saul's wives because he'd be violating God's laws against incest. One of Saul's wives was the mother of David's wife, Michael. So he'd be breaking God's laws against incest if he, if he did marry them. Much more can obviously be said on that, but, but hopefully we can see that contrary to the complaints of feminists and others, the Bible in no way endorses polygamy.